In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Today is the second Sunday of Tuba, and the gospel is from Luke chapter 11. And last week I told you the theme of the month of Tuba is that the Lord Jesus Christ, he came for the salvation of the world. And last week we discussed how you can't accept the salvation of the world if you love the world. You can't accept the salvation for the world if you love the world. They are immiscible. They can't mix together. And today I feel like the gospel is asking us a question, an important question. And the question is, what will it take for you to believe in me? What will it take for you to change our life? What will it take for us to let go of like, our addictions? What will it take for us to offer like, genuine repentance? Because some people, they come to the church, they offer like, no repentance. So what will it take for us to offer repentance? Do we need more signs to believe? Do we need more signs? Do we need more evidence for God? Do you need more like data for, for God? The short answer is that God has given us so many signs. And the greatest sign of his love is the one of the prophet Jonah. And we have a beautiful icon of, of the prophet Jonah. And in the icon of the prophet Jonah, you see how you see the cross in, in the background that going into the belly of the whale was like Christ dying, like a symbol of death. And coming out of the belly was his resurrection, the greatest, the greatest sign. But even like after all of these signs, no matter all the signs that were done, in spite of everything that God has done, somehow we still lack faith. And we have the audacity to demand even more signs. And this is interesting because in Luke chapter 11, the Lord heals a man who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him. And right after he healed him, they say he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. So he performed signs and wonders, and still they did not believe. So that's why I said the question is, what will it take for us to believe? In the Gospel of John, the Lord fed the multitude with five loaves and two fish. And it was an amazing miracle, 5,000 men eating, and they had leftovers. And then after that miracle, the people, they come to the Lord and said, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What, what, what work will you do? And the Lord told them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. So the problem isn't with signs. The problem is not with the signs. There's plenty of signs. The problem is that we're not recognizing the signs. Most of the roads on the street, they have adequate signage to tell you the speed, believe it or not, they do. But even, and now even like Google Maps tells you the speed limit. The problem is not with the signs. The problem is, and I just want the speed and I don't care, <laughs> and I need to go somewhere, and I want to get there. The problem's not with the signs. The problem is our n internal denial of truth. And this reminds me of the, like, uh, the trial of St. Paul. St. Paul was on trial before the Roman governor, uh, Felix, and the, the preaching of St. Paul moved the governor's heart. It started to move his heart, and he started to speak to the governor about righteousness, about self-control, about final judgment, all wonderful things to speak about. And Felix started to feel, oh, this is, and I feel like this is an important stuff. But he was afraid, and he put St. Paul away, and he didn't want to hear St. Paul again on this matter. And a similar thing happened even the next time, like St. Paul was on trial with King Agrippa. King Agrippa, like, he said to St. Paul, he said, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And this is St. Paul, the greatest preacher of Christianity. And he has all the, like, he sees the heavens, he's a miracle worker. And yet, these people still do not believe. They still do not believe. 
Both Felix and King Agrippa, I think they represent people who are intrigued by the gospel. Oh, this sounds nice, but they do not change. They do not change. They know the signs, they see the signs, they know the Bible, but do not change. They don't repent. Both Felix and Agrippa, the interesting thing about them, I think they realize that, ooh, to become a Christian is going to require like a little, like I can't keep the same way that I'm living. I'm going to have to change. And they were not willing to, to make that change. And that's why in the gospel of today, the Lord, he says, this is an evil generation. Why is this an evil generation? Because the Lord, he had done so much, like St. John Chrysostom says, they were ungrateful to their benefactors, and they were made worse when they received benefit. Like Christ was doing all of these things and doing all these wonders and doing all of these things, and despite all of these things that Christ was doing, they still ridiculed him, they still did not believe. And that's why the gospel of today, the Lord gave two amazing signs to this evil generation who would not believe. He said, there's two models that I want you to learn from. And I think from these models, we can learn like an important lesson. The first model is Jonah to the Ninevites. The first lesson is repentance. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the sign of Jonah is the cross and the resurrection. But today, what we want to ask ourselves is what is hindering our repentance? What is hindering our repentance? To be honest, I have nothing against Jonah, but I don't think Jonah was the best preacher. Like, I don't think he was the best preacher. And I don't think it was his eloquent sermon that converted the city of Nineveh. It wasn't. Actually, the only thing the Bible says is he went to Nineveh and said... Yet 40 days and this city will be overthrown. This city will be destroyed. And yet this simple message convicted the people to, to repent. And what I love about the Ninevites is that the whole city repented. The whole city. It was not just a few people. No, it was the whole town, the whole community. The Bible says, so the people of Nineveh believed God and they proclaimed a fast and they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the, to the least. The greatest was the, the king. The greatest was the king. And who was the least? Who was the least? The king issued a decree said, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. And I have a question for you. Al-Ba'ra, what did Al-Ba'ra do? <laughs> why? <laughs> like, why is the Ba'ra, like the cow, have to offer repentance? Why? The, like, if the cows are repenting, <laughs> In the story of Jonah, Al-Ahna, why aren't we repenting? What's our excuse? The church needs repentance. The church needs repentance. We all need repentance, not just the priests, not just deacons, not just servants, not just youth. And I get the impression sometimes parents, they push their kids to repent, and parents, they don't need to repent and confess, or they need to repent and confess. Or this is just a practice we give for the kids to do. And then we grow up when we grow. And the seniors, they don't need to repent. and They don't sin. If you don't sin, then you don't need repentance. But if you sin, you need repentance. So all of us, we need repentance. Even the cows. <laughs> they need repentance. Don't bring your cows to church, okay? But even like everyone needs repentance. A church is community of repentance. All of us is a community of repentance. And that's why when the Lord was speaking to the seven churches, what did he ask from the seven churches in Revelation? He's speaking to the seven churches and he's saying each church needs to repent. Each church, the whole church. He didn't call out a few sinners. Oh, this, just these sinners. No, the whole church needs to repent. We said the theme of this month is salvation of the world, and repentance is our need for a savior. 
If you need a savior, you will repent. If you don't need a savior, then you don't need repentance. We have the sign from Jonah that we should repent. That's why the Lord said, the men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed greater than Jonah is here. The second sign that the Lord gave us was the example of the queen of Sheba, the queen of Sheba. And the queen of Sheba teaches us an important lesson on the desire to learn and the desire to grow. And it says in the Bible, the queen of the south will rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the world. She came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and indeed greater than Solomon is here. And there's uh, some debate in the literature where Sheba is and how long this trip took. And I don't know how long precisely it took, but let's just agree it took a long time to go from Sheba, wherever Sheba is, if it's in Ethiopia, if it's in Yemen, or wherever people believe it is, it took a long time from her to go from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. Some, some say on the order of years. Why would someone take a trip four years to meet Solomon? Because she heard of the wisdom of Solomon. And she had this desire to go meet Solomon. And I, I look at the Queen of Sheba and I say, wow, what great lengths did you go to be edified? What great lengths did you go to be edified? And I wonder if we could say the same things about ourselves. Do we go to great lengths to be edified? Or not really? I mean, we, we live in an age where we don't have to travel anywhere. We, if you want to hear anything, or if you want to learn anything, or if you want to do anything, it's like right here in front of you. And you don't need to do even that much. But do we go to any great length? Do we have that desire in us? You know, if you want to study the Bible, all you have to do is go and you can pull up any, any commentary, Abu Tedras, a million, there's apps, there's everything. Odemek, it's right in front of you. And the queen of this, she went to the end, like from the ends of the world to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And we can't go on our phones and look up a little commentary if we're confused. You know, some people ask some Bible questions, Google it. If you want to, if you're, you, Google has everything. Like, we live in an information, you have everything at your, your, but do you have the desire to go and look? Do you have the desire to seek? Or you don't have that desire? All the resources exist, but do we use them? Like the other day, and I was looking about resources for the liturgy, I wanted to learn more about the liturgy. And I was shocked, actually. You do one little search on Amazon for books on liturgy, you find amazing books on the liturgy. Even I found a book, and I'm going to get it, like for the bookstore. It said, Scriptural Basis for the Divine Liturgy, Meditations on the Coptic Orthodox Liturgy of St. Basil. I was like, oh. Everything you want, is Amazon is amazing. <laughs> like, it's right there. But do you have, the books are plentiful, but do you have the desire to learn? Do you have the desire to learn? I feel like we have become content in ignorance, content in ignorance. And Yanni, even our education, like the kids, they go to school, they go to college, but they're not learning. They're not learning and they have no desire to learn. And actually I feel like we send our kids to school and they get more confused from the things they see in the school and the weird things that they, they teach and the weird things that are promoted. There's no curiosity, no passion, no desire for learning. There's no appreciation for the beauty of anything, of science, of finite beauty. The queen of the south, she desired the wisdom. She wanted to hear wisdom. She went and saw it. And I feel like sometimes we just go through like cycles, cycles. And we just come, like one time I felt this, we were in Holy Week. And I felt we are just doing cycles. Like we, the, the Holy Reading, like the Ho Holy Week is full of readings from the Old Testament. And so someone reads the readings from the Old Testament. And everyone sitting there, like reading their own books or playing games or doing their homework or doing Misharfi'e, we stand up, we say, then we sit down, and then a deacon comes up, sings for 20 minutes. No one's paying attention to anything. And then we go, and then we say, and then we just stand up again, and then we go sit down again. And then it, 
Just like hamsters on a wheel, kiddo. We're just turning, kiddo. And that's like, and then like, Ida, what is that? What is that? Where's the desire to like understand the scripture? Where's the desire? Where's the meditation on scripture? Where is the, where is the desire to learn here? The beautiful thing about the Queen of Sheba is she made an effort. She made an effort. It says when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. And Solomon answered all her questions. And there was nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her. And then she said something very interesting. She said to the king, It was a true report which I heard in my own land about the words of your wisdom. However, I did not believe it. I doubted. I didn't believe it. But I came and I saw it. I came and I saw it. And I think that is... The, like, the takeaway is that you might have doubts and you might have, but you need to come and see. You, might, you need to come and see. And if you come and see, you might find what you're looking for. You might find what you're looking for. Imagine when Philip and Nathaniel are talking and like Philip tells Nathaniel, hey, we found the Messiah, the one that Moses is speaking about. And then we say, it's Jesus, the, from Jesus of Nazareth. And then Nathaniel says, hmm, nothing, can good, nothing good can come out of Nazareth. So Philip says, come and see. He had doubt. And when he had doubt, he got up and he went and he saw. And when he saw, his doubt was taken away. So the Lord is giving signs. Those who seek will find. Those who seek will find. But the ones who just want signs and just want to sit back and just see signs, no, there is no signs for that. That is the evil generation. That is an evil generation. I want to close with one passage from St. John Chrysostom that I, I, I read recently that was very like touching and I think it will, and it shows that we need to take our desire and put it into action. That's why even the Catholic epistle today said, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and truth. You can't just love in word and tongue. You can't just come to the church and say a bunch of nice things blah, 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 and al han and do this stuff and then have no deed or action about it. You have to have action. Look at what St. John Chrysostom says. He says, if one wishes to become a pilot, he does not say, I wish and content himself with that. Imagine your pilot just said, oh, I want to be, and I want to be from the flight deck, folks, and then we just go fly planes. No, that doesn't make me a pilot. I have to go to pilot school and learn about aviation or whatever they learn about. And then he says, if you want to become a merchant, he does not merely say, I wish, but he puts his hand to the work. And again, he who wishes to travel ab abroad, he does not say, I wish, but he puts his hand to the work. In everything then, wishing alone is not sufficient. Like you might have a desire to do things and you might have, but it's not enough just to have this desire. You must put it to action. You must put it to action. He says, but work must also be added. If then, if and when you wish to mount up to heaven, do you merely say, I wish, if you want to go to heaven? Do you just say, I wish I want to go to heaven? Or do you put your like, foot forward and approach God? He says, how then did you say that willing is sufficient? Willing is not sufficient. We have God working with us and acting with us. Only let us make our choice. Let us apply ourselves to the matter as to work. Only let us think earnestly about it. Let us lay it to heart and as follows. But if we sleep on, if we sleep on, we snore, can we expect to enter heaven? How shall we be able to obtain the heavenly inheritance? You can't be sleeping like the five foolish virgins. They were sleeping and they missed the, door, the bridegroom's coming. 
Do not, and this is the time to offer repentance. This is the time to, where's the desire? Where's the spiritual desire? Where's the spiritual zeal? Let's have spiritual zeal. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Amen. Oh,